We are gathered here today to sip some tea, honey. So make sure you guys have your tea cups ready because this tea is what? Piping hot. Hey, you guys, it's your girl T, and I hope everybody's doing good today. I just wanted to tell you guys, thank you so much. I am so ecstatic that everybody liked my credit series, the first episode. Um, I didn't know how people were going to take it or if they were even going to listen to me or they're going to be like, girl, go on ahead and sit down, have several seats. And I didn't get that. Like a lot of people really took away and understood what I was saying. And some people were saying that they learned, you know, things that they thought they knew that they didn't know. So I'm just really happy by the overwhelming positive response to my first credit video. Video. Now, I do want to say this because I didn't mention it before. You know, there are fiduciary rules. And I want to let people know that, no, I am not a financial advisor. I'm not a broker. I'm not an agent. I'm not a consultant. I'm not a CFA. I'm not a CPA. I'm none of that. I'm not on here to give you financial advice. That's not what I do because I don't want you guys to take anything that I say and then you guys go do it and it doesn't work for y'all. Then y'all think y'all have a lawsuit against me. Uh, hell to the no. So I'm letting y'all know now. That's not what I do. I just make YouTube videos and I'm specifically telling you how I went about building my credit, okay? So this is not advice to you guys as far as you know what you need to do. You can do what you wanna do. All I'm doing is really explaining the things that I know about credit and the things that have helped me in my personal life, okay? So that's the difference. I'm not here trying to tell anybody what to do or trying to force anything down anybody's throat. So that is the disclaimer, letting y'all know now. My name is not TT Boyce Watkins. My name is Lovely T, the YouTuber, just telling y'all about what the hell I done did to get my credit where it's at, okay? So now that we got that out the way, um, so in part two, I wanted to just kind of discuss um, kind of like repairing your credit. We talked about why credit was important in the first series. And um, I saw a lot of people making comments saying that, you know, T, what do I do? You know, my parents have ruined my credit. They got all types of electric bills in my name and credit cards in my name. And this is really sad. And unfortunately, this was like a big thing when we were growing up, like in the 90s. And I don't know if it's because some people's parents were addicted to crack. I mean, that's the only thing. I, and I'm not calling y'all's parents crackheads that please don't think that. But I noticed a lot of my friends whose parents had addictions did shit like this, okay? Like they would get things in their names, furniture, light bills, credit cards. I mean, all types of stuff. And I think part of it was the fact that these parents were getting high, but then part of it was the fact that a lot of parents, especially, honey, black parents, just did not understand the importance of credit and finance because Unfortunately, in the black community, things like this are just not talked about. So it's not that people are dumb. It's just people are just unaware. They just don't know. Like, it's not something that's discussed. People have been brainwashed to think that credit is a white man's thing. Or, you know, if you got good credit, you're trying to be white. And I never understood that. But unfortunately, a lot of kids are being affected by this. And when I worked in collections, that was a big issue where we'd be calling people to collect on a debt. And that debt was like in a 12 or 13 year old's name. You know what I'm saying? And the parents were so trifling, they would put the kids on the phone. Uh, you know, it's sad, but it's very common that once kids become, you know, 18 and they're trying to move out on their own and, you know, get their own apartments and, you know, you know, have some type of freedom and they go to apply for apartment, they go to apply for certain things and they're getting denied. And it's a, why am I getting denied? You know, I just graduated high school and then the, the landlord is literally telling them, you have all this shit in your name. You have all this debt in your name where did this come from? And the kid's like, I'm 18. I was just born in 2000 something. Like I didn't create this debt, you know? So it's really, really sad. And parents who are doing that, you should be ashamed of yourself. Yes, I'm shaming you right now. You should be ashamed of yourself. You don't, if you want to mess up your credit parents, that's on you. You're free to do that. That's your business. But when you start dragging innocent children into your fuckery, I don't agree with that. And it's not okay because it affects them very negatively. Now, what I want to tell some of you guys, these are some of the things that I personally use to help clients of mine who are in this situation. First and foremost, if you're realizing that your parents, uh, you know, created a bunch of debt in your name and they have credit cards and light bills and everything, what you need to do is go on to annualcreditreport.com. On that website, you are allowed to get one free credit report every year from all three of the credit bureaus. So the three credit bureau names are TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, okay? And because they're all different, 
Some might have your FICO score at a certain score as opposed to another one. Some might have certain debt on TransUnion that Equifax might not have. Experian might have certain debt that TransUnion doesn't have. So it's good to have all three credit reports so that way you can have a full broad scope of what you know creditors and lenders and you know leasing agents and you know people like that are seeing when they run your credit so you want to have all three because all three may have different information or all three may have the same information but you won't know until you have that now there's all types of fees you can join different you know credit report you know websites and all that stuff but your best bet is if you're young and you're struggling for money or you don't feel you know the need to spend 40 bucks for a report Go on to uh, annualcreditreport.com and you can request all three of your credit reports from those three credit bureaus, okay? So once you get that information, this is the time where you have to now be an adult, unfortunately. And if you're 16, 17, 18, unfortunately, you have to now be the adult that your parent wasn't being when they decide to ruin your credit. So now you have to do your due diligence. You have to go through and look at all the debt that you have in your name. There's going to be the amount of the debt. It's going to show the collection agency or the company that's handling the debt. And then there'll be a phone number. And at that point, you need to call them and explain to them the situation. And what they're going to need from you is proof of this. Because for all we know, you could be lying. You could just be making up this story. So you're going to have to send them proof. And that proof can be your social your birth certificate showing your real age. You know, if your birth certificate shows that you were born in 2001 and it's showing that you have, you know, $10,000 worth of debt in 2005, well, we're going to know you were a baby. There's no way that you could have accumulated $10,000 worth of debt around that time. But again, you have to do your due diligence. If you really want to build your credit and clean up your credit, you have to do that. Once it's proven that it was not you, then at that point, um, they can remove everything off of your credit information. But the reason why some people get scared to do this is because when parents do that, what they're doing is illegal. You're stealing credit. You're stealing money. You're stealing from a company. And sometimes those companies, once they realize that, okay, this person did not make this legal debt, this was done illegally, at that point, they may come after your parent or whoever did it. So that's why some people get scared about trying to clean up their credit because, you know, who wants to put their parent in jail? You know, especially if the parent thought or didn't know, you know, the consequences at the time. So I understand why some folks are torn. They just eat it up. They just end up paying the bills themselves. So it's really going to depend on how you want to handle it. And I'm not saying that every company is going to go after your parent and throw them in jail. That's not what I'm saying. But just know that that can be a possibility depending on the debt, depending on how much it was. You know, if it was something, you know, serious, they may. You know, but the first thing you want to do is establish and let them know that it was not you who created the debt and what they decide to do from then on, that's on them. Um, so that's one of the ways. And, and if your parent didn't burn your credit and you burnt your credit, um, you can do the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Now, you burn, so now let's say you're 21 and you just didn't know any better. Nobody taught you about credit. Of course, you're not learning it in school. You know, you get your first credit card and you're basically thinking it's free money because that's how a lot of young people's mentality is. They have a credit card. They just feel like, you know what? I only have $200 in my bank account. I have this $800 credit card. So that means I have $1,000 to just trick off and do me. That's not how it works, okay? So if you're one of those people, you when you max out your credit card and now the bill is due and you do not have the $800 to pay it back, it ends up going into collections, you know, and you just got yourself into some debt, you need to do the same thing as well. Request all three credit bureau reports. Go through, look at all your debt, look at what you owe, and call those companies. Call them and start working with them. And I know some people spend money on these credit cleanup programs, and they can help, but it's like, why are you paying somebody to basically do what you could do for yourself for free? I mean, they're basically doing the same thing. They're running your credit report. They're calling these agencies. They're trying to work out payment plans. You can do it yourself. Don't pay somebody. If you're already in debt and you're struggling, why pay somebody to do what you can do yourself? Again, it's about due diligence and personal responsibility. You know, and if you make that debt, take that personal responsibility on trying to clear up the matter yourself as opposed to pushing it off onto somebody else and paying somebody else to do the cleanup job. So once you do that, once you contact the company at that point, you can work out a payment plan, a payment arrangement. Now, I do want to talk about SIFs. This was something that we used to deal with a lot when I did um, auto financing. Um, a SIF is a settlement in full. 
And I know that's going to be a question that people will be asking. Well, what if I settle? SIFs can be a good thing or a bad thing, okay? It depends. And it's very tricky for people who are not, who don't really know about um, debt, debt collections. If you're not familiar with that with that space, it's going to be very hard for you to navigate the whole SIF thing, okay? So a SIF is this. Let's say you get, um, let's say you have like a credit card bill for $1,000, right? So you max out the credit card, it goes into collections, and now they're calling you um, between the fees, the, the interest, all the tack on, it's gone from $1,000 to over $2,000 now, right? So instead of the $1,000 item that you bought, you now owe $2,000, you owe the item plus all these fees and everything. So sometimes what people will do, they'll be like, okay, I want to settle, let's do a SIF. And the SIF can go anywhere from 30 I've seen it as high as 50% off of the initial bill, okay? They tend to not go that high. You really got to know how to talk to people to get it, you know, to get a really big SIF. But a lot of times it can be anywhere from like 20, I'll say anywhere from 20 to like 40% off of the, the tab, right? So people will say, you know, I want to do a SIF. I want to settle. Can you help me? You know, I don't really have all the money. So now the agent will say something like, okay, cool. We'll do you a favor. You know what I'm saying? I'll bring this bill down from 2000 to 1500 That's the lowest I can get it. I can't get it any lower than 1500 I'm doing you a favor. And you're happy because you're like, okay, cool. At least I'm not having to pay $2,000. i am saving some money. And they'll tell you, okay, if we do this SIF, you have to pay the whole thing this month. There is no, I'm going to pay it in, you know, in six installments. You have to pay it all this month. We can split it into two payments, you know, pay now and pay later at the end of the month, or you have to pay the entire balance. That's usually how a SIF works. You decide to pay $750 now and $750 at the end of the month. So now what ends up happening is, okay, everything is done. It's going to come off my credit report. I'm so happy. And then three months later, you go to check your credit status. You go to check the credit report and see where it's at, you know, if it's fallen off, see what they put on there. And they have a big fat SIF on your credit report. That's not a good thing because what happens is that when lenders see that and they go to check your credit worthiness and they see a SIF on there, they're going to say this person literally accumulated debt that she owed because obviously when you pay for something, you're confirming that that was your debt that you created and you basically did not pay off the full debt you chose to get a settlement you chose to pay a portion of that debt and that's not cool because if she burns me I know she's not going to not only pay off her debt she's going to allow it to go into collections and once it does she's not going to pay it all off so SIFs can look really bad on your credit report SIFs can look really bad to people trying to give you credit so you have to you have to be careful when asking for a SIF or a settlement in full now the way you can use a SIF to your advantage is if you know the lingo I had a situation for my mom where she owed something and I wanted to get it cleared up for her and um you know it was an older debt you know it's going to be charged off you know in a few years anyways so I asked her I asked the lady and I said you know what I would like to do a SIF on this. Um, you know, I'll pay everything right now for her. But you cannot report it to the credit bureau as a SIF. It needs to just be reported as paid. They don't need to know any details, none of that. And they did just that. They put down paid. No details as if it was a SIF or anything like that. So like I said, if you know the wording and you know who to talk to and, and you know how to explain yourself in an articulate way and get them to understand that, you know, you're trying to rebuild your credit and you don't need anything, you know, messing up your credit or being reported, you know, um, shady on your credit, they'll work with you. But again, you have to know. So again, it's all about doing your due diligence and not just trying to take a shortcut because a lot of times these credit cleanup agencies will offer people SIFs. Okay, I was able to work out a deal. You know, they're willing to, you know, clean up your credit. You know, they're willing to take this off the credit report and you don't even have to pay the full amount. They're willing to take 1500 but that's a settlement. So you need to make sure that, okay, fine, they're willing to take a SIF. How are they going to report that to the credit bureau? So, so those are some of the things that people don't know or don't think about when they're going through these cleanup agencies. So those are some things you have to be aware of because all companies would like for you to pay their full debt that you owe them in full. But let's keep it real. If you charge $1,000, then they tack on all types of interest and late fees and everything else. Most people don't want to pay that. They feel like, let me just pay my original $1,000 debt. So that's why a lot of people are always looking to settle or do a SIF. 
And, you know, like I said, it can be a good thing, but then it can be a bad thing if it's reported as a SIF on your credit bureau because then companies look at that and that turns off companies. So that's something to bear in mind. So now I've talked about ways where you can, you know, clean up your credit report and the difference between settling and paying off the entire debt. Um, another thing that people need to also realize is, you know, this takes time. Just because you pay something off today does not mean it's going to fall off of your credit report, you know, in 30 days. It would be nice if it does, but sometimes it can take upwards of two to three months. And that's why you want to stay on top of it. You want to keep following up. You want to make sure if you pay your debt and you got your payment letter saying that the debt was paid off, you need to follow up with the credit bureaus within three months to make sure that they've taken off any of your debt. Because if you're paying this stuff off, it needs to come off. And if they're not taking it off, then at that point you have a case. You know what I'm saying? You have to be able to contact them and say, look, I paid this off. You guys gave me my letter of confirmation, um, but this is still showing up on my credit bureau report this needs to be moved within the next 30 days and they need to comply so you have to stay on top of it i know a lot of people are asking me about secured credit cards um that's the new thing now um you know i was telling you how when i got my express card like a store card um that's what i did close to 15 years ago you know things have changed and again i'm not trying to give financial advice secure credit cards can be a good thing there's no annual fees um but you also have to keep a minimum amount on the account it's almost like a credit card slash debit card and it's really good for young people to teach them you know healthy spending habits and, and things like that so that can be a good way as well but if you don't have any money to put down because sometimes these secure cards you have to put down anywhere from like 50 to like 400 dollars. so if you don't have any money for that it's not going to help you to get a secured card that's why i said if you can get a store card because that's free, you don't have to put anything down, that's a really good route. When I initially had said that I had paid the minimum payment for the first six months, that's what I was told to do back then and that's what worked for me. And you also have to realize that a store card like Express, their interest rate is not crazy high. So it's not like, you know, they made off with all this money from me. The charge was $100. The interest rate wasn't anything crazy at all. I think it was like maybe like 5 6%. I mean, it's a, it's a store card and this was 15 years ago. So they didn't make a whole bunch from me in interest. So to do that for six months on a store card, for a small purchase is not a bad, that's not gonna make or break you. It's not gonna get rich off of that. And it also helps to establish your payment history and it helps to show that you pay on time. And like I said, the minimum payment was $10. So it was just a good starter card, okay? So now, once you move from that starter card, and like I said, I only did it for six months. You don't wanna do it for like a year or two, but just for six months and then pay off the remaining balance. So now once you get your legit credit card, the difference between a store card with a $100 purchase and a 5% interest rate versus a legit Visa, MasterCard, Discover card, you know, when you get those, those are going to have a higher interest rate. Now you're looking at anywhere from like 10 to 20, sometimes as high as 25%, okay? So now once you get those, you know, those legitimate credit cards, that at that point in time with those cards, you want to pay off your full balance. So I want to make that distinction as to why I was not paying off the full balance on that, you know, little store card, because those are the cards that you use to help kind of show how you pay and that you pay on time. And it's a small balance. Those are like baby steps. But once you get up into the big boy leagues, you definitely want to pay off your credit card in full every month because they will tack on interest and you will see that interest. That $200 charge at, you know, 19% interest tax on every month that it's not paid. And then that's when you get into a situation where you're paying literally double the amount for something that you could have just bought outright at the store. So yeah, when it comes to major credit cards, you want to make sure that those payments are not only on time, but they're paid so now, once you get a legit credit card, one of the things that you want to remember is that you don't want to charge more than 30% of your card's balance. So a lot of times, they'll start you off with a smaller balance, anywhere from eight to $1,000. So let's say you have a $1,000 credit limit. You don't want to charge more than 300 bucks on that um, because a lot of times, what you'll find is that it's going to be a lot harder to pay off that entire $300 balance the following month. 
So you want to be smart. You know, sometimes people have credit misconstrued and they think that it's free money and it's not. It's a double-edged sword because with credit cards, you can either build yourself up and build your credit or you can get yourself into serious debt. So just because you have a $1,000 credit limit does not mean that you need to run out and buy $1,000 worth of stuff. You know, so you always want to keep in mind, whatever I charge this month, do I have enough in my bank account to pay it off in full the following month? Now, if you have $1,000 in your bank account to pay it off in full the following month, then feel free to max out your card. As long as you can pay it off the following month, you can max out. But if you can't, you have to be very, very wary of that and make sure that you don't charge more than 30%. So it's very good to pay the balance in full every month. One that looks really good to the credit bureaus. Um, it's a good rating. And then it lets people know that you know you take your credit seriously and whatever debt you create, you pay off. So that will make you more trustworthy to lenders. And then also, you know, like I said, they'll start sending you a bunch of different cards and stuff like that. And at that point, you have to do your due diligence. You don't want to have too many credit cards or too many, you know, hard inquiries on your um, credit bureau report. Because if you're having a lot of inquiries and you're having a lot of traffic, that can make your FICO score go down. That can make lenders wary. So you want to like really... Uh, determine what cards are worth you signing up for. You know, look for cards that have points. Look for cards that say you don't have to pay anything, 0% interest for the first six months, for the first year. So look for cards that can benefit you before just applying. Like for me, I love Kohl's. I shop there all the time. So it made sense for me to have a Kohl's card. But those are some of the things that you want to think about. Like I love, you know, JCPenney's. I like Macy's. But I don't shop there a lot. I shop more at Kohl's than I do Macy's or JCPenney's. So does it make sense for me to have a hard inquiry, you know, or to get a JCPenney card when I don't shop there like that? You know, like you don't want to just have credit cards just on your credit, you know, just open with just open balances. Granted, you may not owe anything, but you just don't want them sitting there either because it's almost like, well, what is this person doing? Just collecting a bunch of cards. You know, she might go crazy one day and just say, fuck everybody and go on a huge shopping spree and, you know, collect $30,000 worth of debt. Then what are we going to do? So those are the things that you want to think about as well because that's what lenders are thinking about when they're looking at your credit report, when they're looking at what credit cards you have and how you spend and pay your debt. So those are all the things that they'll be looking at. So these are some of the tips in part two that I've used to help you know clean up and clear up people's credits um, and then also things you should do um, versus a, a small store card versus like a major credit card. You know, there's definitely differences in those types of cards. And like I said, after the six months when you have, if you still are using that store card, then at that point, whatever charges you make on that store card, make sure you're paying it off. You know what I'm saying? But whenever you have a major credit card, always make sure to pay it off. You don't want to purchase something and then end up paying for it two and three times over. So you want to make sure whatever you purchase, you can pay it off the following month. That's going to make your payment history look good. That's going to make your creditors happy. That's going to make your credit report look good. So I really hope that these tips in part two helped you guys. So let's go ahead and get the discussion popping. Go ahead and leave a comment. All right, deuces. It's your girl T. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share my videos. You can also visit lovelytea.com to purchase any merchandise. Also, don't forget to click the boxes down below to watch any of my previous videos. Talk to y'all later. Deuces.